yesterday <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> so many were the heartaches. No, but yesterday, I thought I was going to die. My gosh. I took my own message to heart, which yesterday I recorded a video called uh, something like, I'm stupid, <laughs> or I'm an idiot. <laughs> Man, was I an idiot yesterday. But what I did was that I was so convinced of uh, trying to save money because I don't have, I'm on a really tight budget for the next two weeks and I don't really have the funds unless God brings through this uh, rebate thing that, you know, we've had some lost money for, I don't know, if you go to these websites and you find out that you have a rebate or something that, you know, has been hanging around for years, you know, and you, you send for it and they send you back a letter and then you send for it and send you back and sometimes you get money from, you know, the the state treasurer or someplace that you didn't know you had money coming. I guess I have a rebate from a printer from uh, way back, you know, and a couple of years, you know, it's been floating around, I guess. And So I sent away for it and I'm hoping that it comes in and you could pray for that because otherwise I'm on top ramen. <laughs> but in order to go to church, I have to come up with transportation, you know, funds and I just don't really have the money to go to church. And, you know, I've been wanting to get more involved, and, you know, God's been kind of like, you know, yes and no, because he hasn't really said get involved, but he's been making me be patient, and even the message has been about patience, and I just haven't been patient. <laughs> so, I may have to back off of going to church somewhat until I can, you know, wait on the Lord and wait for his timing to be either more involved or just going to the church. And it brings me to an interesting point, is that... Sometimes, you know, you get yourself into expectations rather than realizations. You see, realizing something means that God unveils it to you. You realize, you use your brain and you think about something. And God, if he's inspiring your thoughts, if you're directing your emotions, your devotions, your intellect, your intelligence to the one who made you, then he is able to inspire you by conspiring inside your heart to direct your mind by putting on the mind of Christ to look at things and say, ah, this is what the Lord is doing and I can go in that direction. Because the footsteps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord, even though the direction of a man's heart is his own. So you see, you get to choose the direction you're going, but God's going to order your footsteps. And so if you're heading the wrong direction, he may turn your footsteps around so you're heading the right direction, but better to choose the right direction in the first place. So. In my direction, I've been wanting to get more involved, and you know, God's been saying, you know, kind of nothing really except wait. You know, sometimes those messages aren't that clear. You know, so I decided to jump on my bike, you know, to demonstrate and to prove and to use also as a object lesson for Vivo in this ministry the opportunity of going out and doing that which I would learn from one way or another. And I should have known by what I was teaching yesterday what the lesson would be for me today. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I had to ride my bicycle. It's not a street bike. I'm not a bicycle rider. I don't go on marathons. I don't run. I don't jog. I don't get in shape. But, you know, I work on the ministry. I work in Internet ministry. That is my calling. That's my, I'm making my ministry sure. I'm an Internet, you know, provider of information, so to speak. I'm a person who works on the internet by way of providing ministry to those people that are called of God to find that with which I can provide to them so that they can discover Jesus in a more intimate personal way and to follow hard after him. Not following me, but rather using the tools that are provided to them so that they can develop their relationship with God. And so in knowing that, sometimes I get distracted from that, you know, because it's harder to be that way when, you know, you get yourself into some challenges emotionally, financially, devotionally, or any number of ways. And since my wife is long distance and I was kind of like, you know, wanting to go to church, you know, she's gone on vacation for two weeks. That um, the trials had come. So I decided to jump on the bike and I kind of 
kind of got prepared a little bit. You know, I was getting everything together in a bag. I was going to get my lights and get all this stuff together, and I was going to wear a helmet, you know, and I realized I didn't have a helmet, and then it was like one thing after another, and should have kind of took it from God that maybe I shouldn't go. But, you know, again, you can push it with grace sometimes, and so I extended myself beyond what I could do, and I was riding a bike and went the wrong direction, and followed the directions and went the wrong way and made the wrong turn and couldn't find the streets and by the time I got there over a half hour had passed or maybe a little longer and um, the church is interesting in the way that it's set up is that on a Wednesday night they'll have like a worship thing and then they'll break and have kind of like a fellowship thing and then they'll have the word which is kind of neat I like it it's kind of different but it's interesting you know so anyways I was heading there and riding the bike, you know, and it was getting darker and later, and I was getting colder, and my legs were cramping up, and I was crying out to God, and oh, God, do it for me, ah, you know, whining, because <laughs> it was beyond my means, and uh, today I'm paying a price, boy, my, my upper legs or thighs are sore, but you see, I counted on the Lord to get me there, and so he did, he got me there, you know, and it wasn't on time, but, you know, there is a bro there, that's, you know, I've always enjoyed his ministry. I've seen what he does, you know. And he's, uh, I would call him an assistant pastor. I don't know what he really is. You know, he doesn't have a title. And this church is kind of set up uniquely. It's kind of, I like it. You know, I like what I don't know, and I like what I see, so I'm there. But he's kind of like uh, the go-to guy, you know, and I see him, you know, operating in that capacity. So I've watched him, you know, and I finally said, you know, when I got to church, I went, my legs were really cramping up, and I could barely walk. Got off the bike, and I immediately went looking for him because they were at their fellowship time. And I said, can you give me a ride home, or can I pay somebody to give me a ride home? I didn't say him, but I said, could you ask one of the bros to give me a ride home? Because I figured he's busy. You know, Sometimes men of God are busy. And he said, no, I'll give you a ride. And I said, oh, cool. You know, so he gave me a ride home. Thank God, because <laughs> 21 miles trying to get there took me over two and a half hours. Man, about killed me. Oh, boy. But, you know, I made it, and that was the good thing. And I learned, and that was a better thing. And I choose not to do that, and that's the best thing. <laughs> I don't need to go there, you know. Although, now that I've been there on Wednesday night, I noticed that they didn't have, you know, the recordings going. And it was like, okay, they still haven't recorded it. And I thought, well, that's a bummer. No wonder I would have to go, you know. So, kind of a mixed your bag or a mixed bag. But having said all that, you know, I am so thankful that I got the chance to ride home because I got a chance to visit a little bit, and because I was in a lot of pain, boy, was I in a lot of pain, and kind of like down from all the exertion, you know, and choices that I had made and the consequences of them and, you know, not prayed up and fed up, I kind of was sharing, you know, and it was kind of like, I was kind of depressed, you know, I got done sharing, you know, and I went in the house, you know, my wife's going, and, you know, I kind of sat around thinking about, you know, some of the things that were shared with me about, you know, like jobs, and, you know, most men, when they get together, they go, oh, well, what do you do for a living, you know, I'm in the ministry, <laughs> you know, the kind of an internet ministry, well, okay, but what else, what do you do, you know, and it's like, yeah, well, that's really what I do, but this is what, you know, you want to hear, so I started talking about being disabled, you know, and then also a little bit about, you know, jobs I've had, because, you know, men like to puffed themselves up. So I said, well, you know, I was a journeyman boilermaker. And anybody that knows what a boilermaker is knows that's a heavy duty, you know, multi lifting, you know, you gotta be in shape, break it, make it, you know, kinda take it kind of person, you know, and man, you know, when I was working that job it was pretty awesome. You know, and the same company they moved me into a training uh, to a safety coordinator, safety engineer. And so I was kind of in charge of, you know, like I took my OSHA ten, you know, Cal OSHAs and it was kind of a neat job, you know, and and uh, I enjoyed it, you know, but then, unfortunately, God took me out of that and said, you know, be in the ministry. I'm like, well, Lord, who's going to pay for it? <laughs> Nobody is. So it's kind of like, well, okay, God, you know, we're just going to kind of go along. And that's where it gets challenging for some people because, you see, my wife enjoys because she's not... Her children are grown up, and she's not really involved in anything. Although she tells, teases, and we talk about it. You know, we we had prayed about being in the ministry, and she said, you know, well, you know, this is 
this is what we're agreeing on. So we prayed about it, and you know, she's working, and I'm not. And some people go, oh, God, no, you can't do that. God wouldn't do something like that. After all, doesn't a man provide for himself? Well, yeah, sort of. You know, come walk in my shoes, and I'll tell you what your news is. You know, I mean, hey, you know, if you talk to my family, my friends, my pastors, you know, different people I've worked with, they tell you, don't let Michael go to work. He'll try. You know, and the reason being is that it usually kills me. You know, and I wind up getting deathly ill. You know, I'm just like, oh, you know. But can you get disability from that? Well, not really. It's kind of you know, iffy. So you kind of get into one of those Mephibosheths, you know, experiences where you're either like accepting of what God is doing or you're rejecting what God is doing. You're kind of always stuck between the two when you don't listen to the Lord because your emotions want to be like the other people you see around you. And you're like that, aren't you? You get caught up in the the ways of the world or the people around you. You know, people that have like, you know, the, the family, the nicest little family unit that works, you know, and they're like, wow, you have a wife and kids and, you know, they all grew up fine in the Lord, you know? Cool, man, and you're just jealous because you think, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have had a family? You know, when you haven't had a father, you kind of go, boy, if I ever had kids, I'd make sure that they had a father, you know, and you you kind of like, wow, you know, you want to be like that. You know, and then, you know, even though the Lord may have told you, hey, you know, you don't have children, but you have more children than those that have children. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. You know, and he gives you these comforting words, you know, scriptures. And he begins to show you how in life, you know, you ministered to people or you've been a father to people or you've been, you know, kind of ministering to them in some way, you know, touching their lives, you know. And God uses you in that capacity. But it's not the same when you get among men or you get among some peer pressure group where really they don't put the pressure on you per se but you feel the pressure because you're not normal you don't come right out and say oh by the way you know I have a heliostomy on my side you know and I have to be careful of my fluids and I can't get directly into sunlight because I can get dehydrated and I can't do this and I can't do that but you know in the Lord I'm able to do anything so if God tells me to go do it I go do it you know I've been a missionary and I've been this you know and you, you don't really want to you know kind of like get into a long self statement about who you are because you're more interested about who he is you know and unfortunately that's not always where men are at you know they're more like well that's nice but now we're at a church let's talk about you know and you try to you know kind of go with it and it was kind of like well you know and it's small talk but it's really not my thing you know I, I'm just not a small talk person you know I, I get into places and situations where I kind of go boy lord you know who am I you know I mean here are all these really neat guys, you know, and it's like, man, Lord, you know, they're they're like, you know, the the wonderful people, you know, and you feel more like withdrawn, and you start stepping back, and you start feeling oh, oh, oh. until in the morning, because <laughs> sorrow endures for but an evening, which only comes in the morning, and being so in pain, you know, it's kind of like worn out and worn down and bummed out and blown out, you know, and it's kind of like boy, Lord, you know, I really need a word from you. And God did. You know, God gave me a word last night. You know, it's kind of interesting, you know, that he always comforts me. You know, God said he would be a, a father to the fatherless. He would be, you know, that comforter to those that are mourning. He would be that joy, you know, that we need when we're sorrowful, you know, and broken and of a contrite spirit. And for those of us who are shy or who have some esteem issues inside anyways, those are the challenges that we have to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Because if we don't give Him our whole heart, our heart will deceive us. It will mislead us. It will take us to places that God never intended us to be. Because our faith in God and what He does is what makes us whole. Going through those trials and tribulations, you may fail like I taught yesterday. God may want you to fail at something, like I didn't make it on time, to the church. Because he wants to bring out of you something that you can recognize and realize as far as being dependent upon him, not independent. You see, people that go through life in some way sometimes are independent because they've had that opportunity to grow up into their profession or their obsession or their family unit or their, their home or their state or their, wherever they are at. Where some of us have gone out, you know, and just risked it all, you know, like thrown it to the wind and said, Hey God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I want me to be. Wherever you say, I'll go. And you know, I have an old motto in this ministry that says, 
Others may and you may not. And it's a challenge, you know, in my life to live that constantly because God does it to me anyway. You know, that's one of the things that I've enjoyed. And if you see the video ministry every now and then, I'll bring it up and I'll post it someplace, you know, where people see it. And then they'll kind of go, oh, well, yucky. You know, that's what the Lord's telling you to do. Go for it, you know. God bless you. So the challenge yesterday, you know, of who I have been in my life has been challenging. You know, there's been great trials, you know, nearly dying three times, going through divorces, not just one, but three, you know, three, two, something, anyways. And the point being is this, what God has brought you through isn't meant to make you done or over with or cast aside or put into the refuse pile or you're, oh God, you can't use that person. But rather, opportunities of what God is doing may be made more aware as you go through those experiences and at the end of them you see what God was accomplishing anyways in your life. And that's what's happened in me, you know, is that at times I look at my life and I go, oh man, if only I would have had kids or if only my wife hadn't left me, you know, sleeping around or whatever it may have been. Because you see, not always do we see the rest of the story. We assume and presume much about people and things that they're going through rather than what God, in looking at it from the bigger picture, looks down and says, hey, this was just one of those things that you don't know what I'm doing, but I know what I'm accomplishing. And you may not see in the temporal those things I'm doing in the eternal. And so the long end is the more accomplished reasoning of what God is doing in your life than the short end, which is what you only see today and now as you experience it in this way. <coughs> yeah. And so I had to really come to grips with that last night, sleeping, and today, you know, to really go and say, oh God, thank you for making me an oak. Because you see, an oak doesn't grow straight up like a pine. There are pine trees that grow straight up. There's also lodgepole pine that are really a mess. I mean, they grow branches out everywhere, and they're just like, lodgepole pine is good for nothing but cast into the fire. Literally. You don't use lodgepole pine to make anything except maybe sometimes lodgepoles, you know. But other than that, <clears throat> you're not going to make a lot of buildings out of lodgepole pine. But you take oak, and oak is like really solid wood, but have you ever looked at an oak tree? Man, they got twisted branches growing this way and that way and this way and that way, you know. Then when your leaves come out, it's all big and symmetrical. And you go, well, that's not the way I would have pictured it. <laughs> but that's because blasted by the wind, forced by the cold and the heat and the chill and the time and the stresses on it, it creates a hard wood. It's a hard wood. It's a beautiful wood when you finally varnish it and cut it and make it into whatever you want it to be. And it's heavy, heavy duty. And that's what God might be doing in your life. Don't get caught up in what other people are. Because, you know, a lodgepole pine is good for a lodgepole, you know, and a uh, <clears throat> pine tree is good for pine. A, a redwood is good for redwood, you know, I mean, they're straight and narrow, you know, and I think of a lot of people's lives that have grown straight and narrow, and they're good for what they're used for, you know. But there may be also those with which you don't realize that you are one of those blasted trees that, you know, in the midst of nowhere, you're one of those giant trees covering with shade those that are underneath and giving shelter to those who have need. So let God use your life and accomplish even when you think you failed in some way miserably or you think that you're somehow not worthy to be used of God. Let Him show you what you were meant to be and you will accomplish much more than what you think you will as long as you continue on in the Lord to make full proof of your ministry in Him as He uses you according to His will and not your own. Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Genesis 18.22 The friend of God can plead with him for others. Perhaps Abraham's height of faith and friendship seems beyond our little possibilities. Do not be discouraged. Abraham grew. So may we. He went step by step and not by great leaps. The man whose faith has been deeply tested and who has come off victorious is the man to whom supreme tests must come. The finest jewels are the most carefully cut and polished. The hottest fires try the most precious metals. 
Abraham would never have been called the father of the faithful if he had not been proved to the uttermost. Read Genesis 22nd chapter. Take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. See him going with a chastened, wistful, yet humbly obedient heart up Moriah's height. With the idol of his heart beside him, about to be sacrificed at the command of God, whom he had faithfully loved and served. What a rebuke to our questionings of God's dealing with us. Away with all doubting explanations of the stupendous scene. It was an object lesson for the ages. Angels were looking. Shall this man's faith stand forever for the strength and help of all God's people? Shall it be known through him that unfaltering faith will always prove the faithfulness of God? Yes, and when faith has borne victoriously its uttermost test, the angel of the Lord, who? The Lord Jesus Jehovah, in whom all the promises of God are yes and amen, spoke to him, saying, Now I know that thou fearest God. Thou hast trusted me to the uttermost. I will also trust thee. Thou shalt ever be my friend, and so I will bless thee and make thee a blessing. It is always so, and always will be. They that are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. It is no small thing to be on terms of friendship with God. And you know, that's what I kind of came to the conclusion of <clears throat> today. That though I may fit, if I wanted to, and put on the suit and the armor of the world and its ways and be the professional looking person that in some way looks like and acts like, you know, the job performer or provides for his family or home, it would not be what God has told me to do. I need to follow and to be faithful to what God tells me to do, even to the sacrificing of my own self-esteem on the Mount Moriah, crucifying myself to that with which I would want to do, which is, I'd love to be you know, in the professions and obsessions with working and getting these things and money and having all things provided for, but it wouldn't be faithful. It wouldn't be faith-filled with that dependency that I have of God to be always trusting in Him, to hear His voice, to tell me what to do, to walk with Him and to inspire others to not just figure out what God is doing, like we do sometimes when we sit down and look at the Word and say, oh, well, the circumstances fit what I'm reading today, and, you know, it kind of worked out this way, and there were coincidences, you know, coincidences, and I kind of have a circumstantial God that can work out His will in me because He's ordering my footsteps. Well, that's true. It works that way sometimes. But God wanted more from you and wants more for you than just a coincidence that happens and you could make it a kismet kind of God. No, God wants you to be personal with Him and intimate, to be and have the reality of being able to say, I heard the Lord and He spoke to me. I saw the Lord and He was high and lifted up. I know the Lord and He is my friend. You see, Abraham heard, Abraham saw, and Abraham did. And that's the kind of relationship that God wants you to have. He wants you to know Him in a personal, intimate way, relating to Him every day, in everything you do, always. Trusting Him for your life, as well as seeing Him beyond this life, so that death would have no sting upon you, and there would be no circumstance in your life that you would be fearful of, but that you would pass through the fire of these issues and trials and tribulations you go through so that you would come out on the other side the friend of God. You would hear God's whisper in your ear. No, don't go right, go left. No, don't don't turn there, go forward. No, 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 no. I know men of God, especially like John Corson, who gives a beautiful story, a beautiful analogy of getting into his bug. More, uh, more second. Um, VW. He was getting in his VW and, you know, he's, he's heading out and he was supposed to be heading to church you know and and he was late I guess or something he was going to a meeting you know to teach and the Lord told him turn right you know and he was like if I turn right I ain't gonna make it to church so he turned right you know and he said he heard the Lord spoke to him turn right he turned right and as he went down the road he ran into somebody and then he had this like we call divine appointments you know he met that person shared with him did the thing you know and accomplished what God wanted him to do and when he got to church, he was still on time in some way, or something like that. I can't remember the exact full story. But the point is this. He was driving down the road, and he had that attitude of prayer. 
that he was in prayer as he was going there. And as he was going there, God spoke to him. He said, turn right. So he did. I've had those experiences where God says something to you and you go, huh? And you look around to see if there's somebody there, first of all, you know, because our mindset isn't really God said. We're not thinking that God will speak anytime. We're acting like God don't speak most of the time. And we really are shocked out of our shorts when God speaks sometimes. And so don't be denying that with which the Holy Spirit may be wanting you to learn and to grow therein. And that's what Abraham learned, was that though God had spoken at some times, he didn't speak all the times. And the in-between times challenged him greatly, as you can see by his life and the things he went through. And until the last moment of the downward stroke of that knife, he would have killed his son. It would have been the first... No, I won't say that. But anyways, let like me say the first abortion, but it wasn't really abortion because the kid was already alive, so it would have been the murder. You know, He would have murdered his son. And the reality of that downward stroke is mentioned in the scriptures in the Hebrew, the phraseology of how it was, because he knew, by God knew by his heart, Abraham was ready to do it and God's doing it. Oh, sure, there's some people that use some you know, little parts of it to say, oh, well, he expected that you know, if he does kill me, if I do kill my son, well, I'm still going to have you know, something. God will work it out. And that's partially true. But the scripture completely is true by being the author and finisher of our faith that God being in as of such that he gave in the word itself the knowledge that Abraham, yes, was willing to give up his only son. We have to give up something in order to get something. If you really want to know God, you're going to give up much. I have to give up my quote-unquote normalcy in order to be abnormal, to be the faithful friend that I would be if I would just yield myself to the leadings of the Spirit as He teaches me and guides me through this life. I would be the friend of God as I continue to listen carefully for when He speaks to me, as I demonstrate to my wife continually, seeking God to speak to both of us and showing her faithfully over and over again by the witness and the testimony that God does for me in proving his reality to her in ways that she's dumbfounded by the fact that God operates, God intervenes, God directly does things that blows her mind. And I tell her, hey, the day will come when God will speak to you. Don't be surprised. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. Now, besides circumstantially, you know, as we read the Word of God and as we study the Word of God, you know, and as you go through your devotions, and I always say, hey, you want to know God's Word, you know, or you want to really get intimate with the Lord, you know, get a devotional. That's what Vivo was started about. Video devotionals. Vidivo. <clears throat> to know Jesus in a personal intimate way, you should have devotionals. Some people have devotionals only from the Word. Some people have devotionals only from books, like Daily Light, you know, which is only scripture, or Streams in the Desert, or God Calling, or Utmost for His Highest, or Tozer Teachings, or K. Arthur's uh, Speak to My Heart, O oh God, or any other book. Chuck Smith's um, Wisdom for Today, I think it's called. But the point is, God can speak through a donkey. He can speak through those. God can speak through creation, even the very nature of God himself being revealed in that which he's created, the Godhead. How? I don't know, <laughs> but he can. Now, can God speak audibly? Yeah, and he has to me. And that's why in this ministry, it's been that way for causing others to provoke them and to invoke within them the desire for God more so not just to know Jesus, but to know his Father, to know the Spirit, to know the Son, to know them in an intimacy that God said he would give us in John, that we should become one in the Spirit, one in the Lord, one with the Father and the Son and the Spirit, that we should come into a unity of the faith that God has given us so that we would hear his voice and we would know his will and God would speak to us. And that's what you should go after. Because God may speak to you through your church or through your pastor or through a friend or a neighbor or even on the internet through an internet ministry or an internet pastor or an internet person or whatever it may be. But God wants to be intimate with you today. He wants to walk with you now. He wants to talk with you in the cool of the day as he did with Adam. But in your day, he wants to be with you always because he never leaves you. 
Whether you recognize that gift of the Holy Spirit that's inside you, or upon you, or with you, or anointing you, God has appointed for you to be at one with Him, which is what eternal life is. And this is life eternal. In that they should know me and know Him who sent me. And that's what eternal life is going to be. It's going to be knowing God. Well, as much as we can know, and constantly growing in that knowledge of God from ages to ages to ages to ages in a never, a never ending, never repetitious, constantly going through new age, new earth, new heaven, new age, new earth, new heaven, new age, new earth, new heaven, on and on, as the Hebrew says. Because eternal life is an eternal unless it's ages to ages life. Because the Hebrew has the expression of ages to ages life. But the <clears throat> Greek eternality or eternal could end when there's an ending thereof of the parameters with which time ends. If time ended, which we know it can and it will, because it's dimensional, then in the Greek, if we said eternal life, it would end. I'm sorry. You would have an end at the end. In the end, you could be poof, toast, and God will have fulfilled his word. But because it's an ages to ages, that means that Though there may be ages of some type of differentiation of some type of sequential events, it doesn't necessarily mean that those sequential events or those events within each age is a time differentiation. It is a different differentiation of a segmentation of something going on in a continuation of that with which we normally would relate to as being time. But it doesn't have to be time itself. It can be event to event to event to event, which is why it's called ages as opposed to time ages. I mean, you could say ages are years. You could. But you don't have to. And that's why the Hebrew covers it. And that's why God covers us in that perspective when you get into word studies and things like that because we're always going to be learning about Him, getting to know Him, becoming not just the friend with God, not just be like Abraham from a distance, but like Jesus knowing God, being a son of God. And that's what you're being called to be. That's what you're being made into the image and likeness of His Son to become. You are going to be a son and daughter of God. 